Hello, Carol Fallers. I am really, really pleased to bring to you one of my absolute favourite people. She's a really, really dear friend of mine. Blows my marbles, her brain, so often. Um, I'm probably going to be butting in as much as you guys. I'm going to be putting my hand up a lot saying, say that again, explain it differently. We've had a little bit of a run through before now. And I keep going, stop, slow down, say that again, say it differently. <laughs> So we're going to make sure that all of you can keep up and we're going to try and get Kathy's brain to slow down. Kathy, please introduce yourself. Tell people who you are so that people can understand why you're talking about this topic. Hi, folks. Great to meet you all. Uh, so I'm a veterinary surgeon. Um, I qualified from the Royal Vet College in 1999. I've always had an interest in anesthesia and pain, and that's basically because I'm a brain geek. So I've always been interested in altered states of consciousness, pain processing, and all of that clever stuff that goes on in the brain. So during my clinical career, um, I've, uh, I've kind of focused on anesthesia um, and analgesia, and I've just completed my residency in, uh, from the European College of Veterinary Anesthesia and Analgesia. But in parallel to that, um, I've also um, followed up on my passion to learn more about how the brain works. Um, and I did that primarily uh, through my PhD at Oxford University, which was in behavioral neuroscience. Uh, and I subsequently worked as an assistant professor of neuroscience and anesthesiology in New York. And I'm now back in the UK. Uh, and now I'm in Newcastle. I'm the director of the Comparative Biology Centre. But I'm also director of Barking Brains, which is uh, started as an outreach project um, with just me and my four dogs, uh, kind of sharing my thoughts on neuroscience neuroscience for the behavior and training community. So the only time that we ever can talk at a same level because she's always a pitch above me is when we're drinking gin and suddenly I feel like I'm <laughs> keeping up with this lady because seriously it's nuts what comes out of her mouth. So I really hope that you enjoy tonight because I think it's going to really leave you thinking because every time I talk to her, I'm left thinking, yes, I, 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 I get it now. So by the end of this evening, we hope that you guys will go away and start thinking about what you do with your dog. Because I think there's a real misunderstanding about what a dog does and why they do it. And there's still a real belief that a dog would not do something if they felt it was detrimental for themselves or if it actually hurt at that moment in time. But that's really not true. And we're going to look into why. So let's start at the beginning. You're going to take the lead and I'm going to keep butting in going, no, too complicated. Go back a bit. So, okay. so overall, what I'd like to talk about is start by looking at exercise um, and what the benefits of exercise are and what's going on in the body during exercise. And then look at where that can go wrong for our dogs and for us as humans. Um, and then maybe look at some of the other ways that you can get the same benefits of exercise, but without the detrimental effects. So that's the kind of overview of the direction we're going in. Um, and exercise is really interesting because um, there are a number of, of um, really important benefits from exercise. So when, when conducting exercise or, or when doing exercise, there are a lot of chemicals that are released in the body in much higher concentrations than they would be usually when you're not doing exercise. So those chemicals um, are things like adrenaline, and adrenaline will help kind of increase the heart rate and increase the blood pressure and increase the blood flow to the muscles. So you're getting that physical benefit to, um, to the adrenaline release that's helping you to do the exercise. But there are also other, um, other chemicals that are released, um, opioid chemicals. So um, that would be endorphins. Um, I think most people have probably heard about endorphins and the endorphin rush. Um, and endorphins are natural painkillers, but they also make you feel good. They have a kind of well-being, mood enhancing effect as well. Um, so endorphins are released in higher concentration when you exercise. And they provide um, analgesia, so pain relief during the exercise so that you don't feel the pain associated with 
pre-existing injuries, etc., and you can carry on doing the exercise. And largely they do that by increasing motivation um, and also by directly inhibiting the pain signals. And similarly, there's another um, group of chemicals that are released called endocannabinoids. Um, and I know that you guys have talked quite a bit about CBD oil. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the natural substances that are released inside the body that are the reason that we're studying CBD oil, because we're trying to work out how we can replicate the effect of the natural substances, but we haven't yet managed to replicate that effect. So I'm not talking about CBD oil and I'm, I'm not suggesting that we've got to the stage where we've got uh, a chemical that we can take exogenously that will um, do the same thing as endocannabinoids. But endocannabinoids, the natural endocannabinoids are really important, again, for direct analgesia, so direct pain killing effects, but also in terms of um, improving motivation and mood and those well-being aspects. And then there are some other chemicals that are released. So serotonin is one of them. And some of you may not have heard of serotonin, but serotonin is a neurotransmitter and it's incredibly important for um, mood again. So it's known as the happy neurotransmitter. Um, it's slightly more complicated than just being the happy neurotransmitter. It's definitely involved in mood, but increases in serotonin can also be associated with aggression, depending on where those increases occur. Um, so it's quite a complicated picture, but there are big changes in serotonin associated with exercise and they do contribute to the kind of euphoric well-being state that you get when you exercise well I mean usually I get a, a state where I'm gasping for breath and thinking I'm going to drop dead <laughs> but I'm sure after that there's a euphoric state it's always at the end Kathy it's always at the end <laughs> That's just That's I, I was a bit bitter <laughs> um, and then the last one to think about is dopamine and dopamine is a neurotransmitter that we classically think of in terms of reward circuitry. So the idea that when we find something rewarding, we get an increase in dopamine. And again, that's an oversimplification because dopamine is actually um, uh, um, dopamine it, processing actually goes on in a lot more areas than just reward processing. But it is true that it is critical to reward processing. And what's really interesting about this kind of soup of chemicals that gets released is they don't all necessarily act individually. So they can influence the way that the other chemicals are having their effects. So, for instance, opioids and endocannabinoids can bind to dopamine receptors and they can change the way that the body responds to dopamine. So we can come on to wow. that a little bit later when we talk about what the negative effects of exercise or repetitive exercise might be. But overall, what we're looking at is that exercise um, releases a whole soup of different chemicals and that those chemicals have the effect of actually directly inducing analgesia, pain relief, and then indirectly inducing a positive well-being state that's associated with less anxiety and less pain. So and does that's that what we want from the exercise, yes. Yeah. So we... We would all dream to be able to exercise our arthritic dogs, whatever age they are, to a degree that they get only pleasure and well-being from it and they don't do any harm yeah. to them. That's what yeah. we're trying. That's exactly but, what we're aiming for. But the difficulty comes, particularly if we focus in on the two um, chemicals that have the most pain killing property. So endocannabinoids and opioids, um, endogenous opioids. And both of those classes of chemicals um, affect pain, pain processing at different levels. So what do I mean by this? Um, if we take the example of an arthritic knee, for instance, so the dog has an arthritic knee or stifle, there, it, there are pain mediators within that knee because of the pathological process that's going on in the knee that will cause nerve fibers to activate in the knee and then travel signals all the way up the leg to the spinal cord. So that's the beginning part of the communication to say there's something wrong with this knee. That's the beginning of the pain processing. Once those signals get to the spinal cord, there's a whole lot of modulation that goes on. So that means that those signals that are arriving at the spinal cord can either be dialed up 
to be made more important or dialed down to be made less important. And that can happen within the spinal cord before those signals have even reached the brain. Mm -hmm. Then the modulated or changed signal is then sent from the spinal cord to the brain. So by the time it gets to the brain, the brain is already receiving information that's been changed in some way, either dialed up or dialed down or changed in some way. And then in the brain, there is a whole lot of complex processing that goes on that not only dials up and dials down the pain, but also starts to separate out the different aspects of the pain and change those different aspects separately. And if you're still following me, then overlays it with a whole lot of emotional processing and then cognitive or, or attentional processing. So there's quite a lot of complex processing that goes on in the brain. Let's make an example of that, okay? So let's talk about um, a, a pain signal that has started in the knee and it's made its way up to the brain and it's being perceived in the brain. And this literally takes nanoseconds, guys. So if you thought pain was in the knee, I can assure you it's not it's in the brain. Okay, so that's suddenly know that there's, there's pain. But what Kathy's trying to say is that our previous experiences, our emotional state, and what context we are living in can influence how we perceive that pain and respond to it. So I always use this example, and I hope you like it. If I was driving to go and do a lecture, and my car broke down and it was raining, and I was just like, oh, for God's sake, oh, and I get there, and the first thing I do is stub my toe on a door frame. That pain, because I'm in a poor emotional state, is likely to be, feel pretty damn bad. But if I stopped off on the way and actually got a lottery ticket, I've just won £250,000, and then I stubbed my toe, that pain is likely not to be as bad. Is that an okay example? Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, that's good. a good example. And then adding memories to it, if I had stubbed my toe on that door frame and it had led to a broken toe in a previous life and I knew I had serious amounts of surgery and you know it was a long process a really negative process that potentially could also affect my feelings of having stubbed my toe again because my memories tell me that it was really bad and it was really awful and it went on for a long time that can also affect how I perceive that pain true yes definitely and actually that's one of the theories behind why dogs don't show early signs of pain that we know that there are um, the nerve fibers are firing um, associated with early disease but they don't show behavioral signs of pain and one of the theories is because they're not catastrophizing in the same way as humans do so humans if they had pain in the knee by the time they'd had pain in the knee for a couple of weeks, they'd already be thinking about the knee replacement they're going to have to have when they're older and how they're not going to be able to play squash anymore. And, you know, they're going to be old and crippled before their days. And all of those things would be coming into their mind. And that affects their emotional and mood state. So then, therefore, that affects the pain processing. And we think that actually animals don't we don't have evidence that animals catastrophize um, and actually it wouldn't make sense for them to do that it doesn't make sense for us to do it but we still do it but it's kind of like a, a side effect of having such an amazingly complex brain if you're a human um, but that's one of the theories behind why animals don't show that that um, level of early <laughs> pain. <laughs> what's that that another great real life analogy for you I am convinced that I feel pain more now that I spend so much time talking about it. So oh, when I yeah. have, yeah, because I've had quite a lot of hip pain and back pain in the last few months, I've been like, oh my God, I'm having this for life. This is, a, I've got to live with this forever. Yeah. And therefore, I perceive it as being worse than it actually potentially is. So, hmm. So yeah. There's really good evidence to show that. And they've done numerous studies with humans where they take humans that are in pain and they either talk to them about pain or drop pain words into literature that they have to read more frequently than the control group and show that they have higher pain scores. So if you're thinking about pain, if you're talking about pain, if you're focusing on pain, you will be in more pain. And that isn't just um, psychosomatic. I mean, it is psychosomatic, but psychosomatic has such a negative connotation 
emotion because we used to think that psychosomatic was equivalent to making it up or moaning about it and actually that's not the case we've shown now with brain imaging and also with more invasive studies but that that effect, that that perception effect, is a real effect. It really changes your brain chemistry. It really changes your brain connections, and over time, it actually changes the way that your pain circuits link up to the emotional and cognitive parts of your brain. So it's changing that circuitry long term, and that's one of the reasons why in human chronic pain uh, management now um, we're looking more to how to influence the emotional and cognitive components of pain perception. And that's partly because we're pretty rubbish right now at dealing with the pharmacological direct analgesic part of chronic pain um, because we're we're lacking in really good drugs that don't have significant side effects but also because yeah, we, yeah we've realized how important it is and also because we've looked to other countries so there are eastern medicine countries where they've been practicing meditation and yoga for chronic pain for many many years and shown reliably that they uh, that um, people have lower pain scores well of course now with the age of imaging and more invasive science, we can now prove that that is the case. We can now show that those patients are actually experiencing less pain. So we're realizing that, you know, the mind is an amazing thing. Yeah, yeah. I had to do a talk the other day and my my best description for um, how the, the pain system works, and again, you might disagree, but it's like a, it's an old house and it's covered in ivy and every time you're cutting one bit down, it's already, already branched off and it's going a different route. So you're kind of chopping down that section. It's gone round the back. It's gone through the brickwork. It's going. We really struggle because the nervous system. A lot of people believe a bit like the skeletal system. You're born with it. You grow it, and it's then there. That's it. The skeleton doesn't change. Your nervous system doesn't change. But it does. It's highly plastic. It's adapting and changing and remodeling and sprouting all the time. As much as if I wanted to go and develop a six pack and you know build my muscle and change my physical shape my nervous system's doing that you know it's not just yeah. the muscle change of the nervous system and I think people forget that um how adaptable yeah, and actually there's uh, research now showing that the initial physical changes associated with strenuous exercise, such as weightlifting, for instance, are changes in the neural circuitry, not changes in the musculature. So the changes in the musculature are actually not the primary changes that are leading to strength changes. It's the changes in the nervous system that are leading to the strength changes. So that, that plastic ability or ability to change um, and modify over time is absolutely key to um to function um but of course sometimes that also means that it works against us um as with all systems so understanding that the system is constantly updating and constantly changing is really good so that we can think about how we can influence that yeah okay so let's go back to the topic in hand which is about exercise and the balance between exercise that we get the benefits of potentially some pain control, um, a positive state of mind, you know, a, a good emotional state. And when we dip very quickly into the negative aspects that yeah. of exercise. So I guess to do that, let's think about what those aspects of exercise are and then think about um, where they might be working against us. And also we can move on then to how we can get those benefits without some of those um, side effects or, or negative effects. So during exercise, you've got this direct pain killing effect from the chemical soup that's been re released. Um, and we've already said that you've got the emotional component and the cognitive component, but you've also got some other things going on there that when are- you talk, When you talk about cognitive and emotional, just clarify for people that are going, oh, you've lost me. Yeah, so um, when we're talking about the emotional component, we're talking about how anxiety, fear, pleasure, joy, those different emotional states influence the pain state. And we now understand a lot more about that. For instance, it's been shown that um, patients that have high levels of anxiety are much more prone to acute pain, so post-operative pain, but also much more prone to developing chronic pain. So there's that interaction there between anxiety and, and pain processing. Mm -hmm. And then if we think about cognition, we're thinking about um, 
attention, so attentional processing, which is incredibly important for how we perceive pain. And your example of the stubbed toe was a good one. You know, your, your reporting of how bad the pain is is entirely different if you're holding a £250,000 lottery ticket in your hand, or if you've got the experience that, you know, the toe was, um, was broken before and you're having a bad day anyway, and your car's broken down on the motorway and all of those other things. And that's, that's um, partly mood, so um, partly the the mood that you're in that's influencing the pain, but also partly the attention. So if you've got two hundred fifty thousand pound ticket in your hand, you're not going to be paying attention to your toe because, quite frankly, you can, you don't need to worry about the toe. Even if it's broken, you can just have it privately removed in a private yeah. hospital with caviar and champagne and all the rest of it. You're just that's gonna... cognitive. So people that are getting confused with that word cognitive it's it's attention it's yeah think about it in terms of attention it's also learning a memory so it's also related to your past experience and your learning and memory associated with what's going on um but attention is is a big part of that um and shifting attention and we can use you know i use attention to to modulate my own acute pain so the the toe stubbing is a good example. If I stub my toe, I immediately start thinking about something else or focusing on something else. And it's it's purposeful. It's not subconscious. I've, I've decided, OK, I know I need to shift my attention from my toe to reduce the amount of pain that's being processed from my toe. So I start mm -hmm. focusing on something else. Um, and, you know, the more the more interesting or the more motivated you are to focus on that other thing, maybe it's eating chocolate or whatever it is, then the less you'll process. So the take home message tonight, guys, if you do anything painful to yourself, put it to the back of your head and go do something more fun. <laughs> yeah. And don't feed chocolate to dogs. That's the other message. You can eat the chocolate, but not the oh. dog. So, so yeah. And then the we've got in the brain and you've got the emotional and cognitive. Yeah. And then you've also got some other things that are fairly unique to exercise or well, not unique, but they're they're a really big part of the indirect pain killing effect of, uh, of exercise. So distraction is one of them. And distraction has been studied in quite some detail in human subjects. It's also been studied in animal subjects and the animal research uh, backs up the human research. But obviously, with the human research, we also get the um, opportunity to hear from the patients um, so we can examine the, the pain in a different way. But what the human research has showed us is that uh, when distraction is used um, to distract from either acute or chronic pain, um, if you image the brains of people whilst that distraction technique is being used, you can see that their primary and secondary somatosensory cortex, so that's the surface of the brain that is responsible for processing the incoming pain information, that that activity is dialed down. So those areas are less active. And if they're less active that just means you can you you know the knee can send all of the signals it wants screaming saying my knee's hurting my knee's hurting my knee's hurting but the brain's going can't hear you can't hear you my activity dialed down I can't hear you so it's not going to then be moved on and processed by the brain and perceived as painful even though that painful process is still going on in the knee it's blocked at the somatosensory cord. can I give a good example of this because I think people will relate to this you know how when you've got like a tummy ache or you're feeling really quite unwell and you've managed to get through your working day but as soon as you go to bed it becomes unbearable because there's no <laughs> directions and suddenly your your all your ability to influence the perception of what's happening is taken you know all of the distractions are taken away you're like oh yeah, yep, completely. And this morning I had an example. So I've had a migraine for about four days. Um, and last night I literally couldn't sleep. I just had to sit up and read and watch telly because I just couldn't sleep. It was so painful. And this morning I woke up and it was still so painful. And then the postman knocked. And for anyone who's watching this who knows me, when the postman knocks in my house, <laughs> the whole road know about it. <laughs> <laughs> because the dogs were ballistic. So the dogs all left up and like acted like World War Three was coming and this was, you know, the end of all. And of course, I run out of bed because I'm so conscious of the neighbours. I want to calm it down. And also I want to get to the postman so that I can actually calm the dogs down. So for that brief moment between being in bed and then getting to answering the door, well, it wasn't a moment, it took me a little bit longer to get there. 
I wasn't thinking about um, the migraine at all and didn't have any experience of migraine during that period of time. But as soon as I shut the door with my parcel in hand, then the flashes start again and the pain starts again. And that's not um, that's not psychosomatic. That's not made up. That's just simply that it, for that period of time between being in bed and answering the door, my body had something more important to do. Um, and so it just shut out all of the signals associated with the migraine. Um, so, yeah, I can ask the postman to come around more often so I have less migraine pain, <laughs> but it's not worth it. <laughs> I'm effectively going to be moving in with you at some point soon, and I'm dressed. <laughs> well, I'm now looking into, this is an aside, but I'm now looking into getting a plastic parcel drop outside my door. I can't get a metal one because they'll just sit by the door waiting for the metal chink <laughs> so I have to get a plastic one. Really interesting living conditions. <laughs> We're back with the fact that exercise can be influenced. Um, we've got the distractive component of it. Yeah. We've got the logical component of it. And also anticipation, which we haven't talked about. But there's really good research showing that the one of the effects of the attentional changes or the, the attention shift is that you get uh, an increased inhibition of pain pathways. So that means that the signals, the electrical signals that are going through the neurons are dialed down, they're inhibited. Um, and that's the attentional shift associated with it. And that starts to happen before the exercise. So that starts to happen in anticipation of the exercise. So if your dog knows that you go to the park twice a day, before around about the time that you usually go to the park, your dog will start having that anticipatory analgesic effect or pain relief effect. Wow. Um, and that's, I mean, you know, um, when the dogs become kind of more, uh, shh, baby, be quiet. Yeah, no, arrived. Yeah, that's actually a firework, not the door, but. It's COVID. No one's allowed fireworks during COVID. We've been going all week. I don't know what's going on. It's insane. Very bored people. Very bored people. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, what, what were we saying? Anticipation. Yeah. So, yeah. um, you know, you, anticipation can be responsible for increased locomotion. So you'll see that the dog might um, anticipate that it's walkies time and get up and start moving around, but is also associated with inhibition of pain signals. So it's also preparing the body for that exercise and um, um, starting to release those chemicals that are going to be so key to the exercise process. So this is something that we see all the time where an owner gets the lead and the dog that's got two absolutely crappy knees, bad hips, lumbosacral, lots of soft tissue pain, starts jumping up, trying to grab the lead, trying to grab the lead, trying to grab the lead. And then the owner says to me, well, he wouldn't do it if it hurt because, look, he's jumping around like an nincompoop. Yeah. And we're going to do a two mile run. He can't be in pain. And you're like, yeah. Okay. So this is where we need to understand that pain isn't either there or not there. It's um, the, the pain can be there in the knee and the pain can be there even up to the spinal cord and part of the pain can even get to the brain. But if the brain dials down or the perception of pain, the body won't respond in the way you would expect it to, to the pain. Because the body's usually usual response to pain is, oh, no, I don't want to get up, thanks. I'm really painful. I'll just stay here. But of course, if the brain is overriding that by increasing the inhibition, then the pain signaling is still there. So the animal is does still have that nociceptive effect, nociceptive effect, meaning the, the um, pain stimulation. Um, the disease, the problem. Yeah, the problem. But the behavior isn't going to reflect that because it's mm -hmm. being overridden by these systems that interact with pain processing. So these cognitive systems and these emotional systems. So it's true that whilst the dog is bouncing around waiting for you to get the lead on, it's not thinking I'm in pain, I'm in pain, I'm in pain. But it's also true that it is actually still receiving those pain signals and, and it's receiving those pain signals because it's causing tissue trauma while it's jumping around. And so the body is desperately trying to say, hang on a minute, slow down. You know, this I've got inflammation here and it's getting worse and you're jarring my joints, etc. But it's just that the brain is so powerful at being able to override that in the short term. And that's actually and that's, something, that's something that we've needed throughout, you know, evolution in that the brain yeah. has got to be able to 
override pain to be able to get out of sticky situations. You know, yeah. you hear about the dramatic stories of the soldier that's had his leg half blown off and he still manages to get back to the, you know, the personnel and make it to safety. That is something that's really quite important for us to be yeah. able to have. What we Sorry, to be careful up. of is that we're not, <laughs> who's that? Is that Dennis? Dennis. <laughs> Hello, Dennis. <laughs> Dennis is the coolest dog ever, ever. He doesn't look very happy because, uh, oh, I don't know if you can see. It's there's, a little, there. there's a Rottweiler face there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so what we have to remember is that these, these, these kind of circuitry, this system that we've got in place isn't to be abused. Yes. It's there to make it's a survival thing and what we yeah. find a lot of the things that we're doing with our dogs is almost abusing a system that actually shouldn't be used in the way that we're using it. Is that fair to say? Yeah so the system was originally evolved or designed if you like um, to basically get you out of sticky situations like you said. So if you're a gazelle and you're being chased by a big cat and the big cat grabs one of your legs you don't want to be crippled by the pain associated with that because you're definitely going to die. You want to be able to ignore the pain associated by that and carry on running. So that's why we have these systems. That's why we have this override. We need to be able to shift attention to something more important. But of course, that does mean that, um, it, that the systems can work against us, um, particularly where we're not naturally just pottering around, but where we're actually um, motivated to do exercise that goes far beyond what our joints can cope with. So I guess um, the, the kind of most extreme example to use for dogs would be ball chasing. Um, Here we go, guys. We're going to get the haters in. They're going to arrive yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, bear in mind, this is your education. If people start to agree that we're talking about ball throwing, I'm sorry, but it needs to be addressed. Well, and the important thing to remember about ball chasing is that you get all of those benefits of exercise. So you get all of the endorphin release, the endocannabinoid release, the serotonin release, etc. It's very rewarding. You get the dopamine activation associated with that. So that's all great. But the difficulty comes with the fact that not only do you get that direct and indirect painkilling during the process that stops the body from recognizing that it's doing much more damage to the joints and it is doing much more damage to the joints there's no doubt about that if it far i'm talking about fast repetitive ball throwing i'm not talking about any use of the ball like the ball itself is not the problem it's the way that you use it and if you're standing still and repetitively throwing the ball and the dog's running bringing it back running bringing it back that kind of exercise will certainly increase the trauma in the joints and will um promote the pathology within the joints but of course you're also getting a lot of beneficial effects in terms of well-being and endorphin rush and painkillers etc so we need to think about how to harness those positive effects without having such a degree of trauma to the joints so the types of things to think about are um, we want to slow down the, the play with the ball. So um, rather than repetitively throwing it and throwing it far, I mean, the ones that I really hate are the ball slingers because ball mm. slingers, they throw the ball really far, but they also throw it really fast, much faster than, you know, you can with your arm. And of course, the dogs shoot after them at 100 miles an hour in a completely straight line. So their entire attention, focus and motivation is on that ball to the exclusion of everything else. And particularly in this case, to the exclusion of their arthritic joints. <laughs> So um, simply slowing down the speed that the ball is thrown at will really help because the slower it's thrown, the less trauma there will be. And it doesn't necessarily then matter how far you throw it as long as the, the dog is running more slowly in order to catch it. So you don't get that kind of total missile type focus like beep, 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 beep <laughs> onto the ball. Now you can go one step further than that, which is actually not to use a ball at all, but to use um, frisbees. And the advantage that you have with frisbees is that 
What's also been shown with direct linear um, intense exercise is that you don't only get the pain killing effects, but you also get modulation of the dopamine reward system. And the dopamine reward system is a circuit within the brain that rewards. So it basically makes you feel good um, and tells you what you should repeat. So yeah, that felt brilliant. Let's do another one. I just eaten that bar of chocolate. It was wonderful. I must have another one. That kind of thing. And does it really reinforce as well? So if you've had a pleasurable experience and it's like, oh, that was really lovely, it gets reinforced every time it goes round. It becomes more secure. Yeah, yeah. and sense. there. Are there are specific things that can influence that. So if you're doing an activity to the exclusion of other sensory input, so this is where we start thinking about sensory integration, which is where your, your brain, you know, we said that the pain signals are going from the knee to the spinal cord and then to the brain. Well, that's just one piece of sensory information, but actually your brain is receiving a whole load of other sensory information. It's receiving visual information, auditory information, tactile information from where our feet are on the floor and proprioceptive information. Yeah. Temperature yeah. Yeah, is another one. Um, and also internal sensory information. And all of that information is meeting in the brain and then jumbling around and being modified so that the brain can decide what to focus on, what to um, what to use its energy on and make sure that its behaviours are appropriate and proportional. So that mm -hmm. integration process is really key. And the integration process, it won't surprise you to know, is entirely affected by attention because what you're paying attention to will basically be dialed up in the brain so the brain is going to focus on oh let me focus on processing that bit of sensory information because that's the bit that we're paying attention to so that must be the important bit of sensory information now the difficulty with ball throwing where it's fast repetitive and in a straight line is that that type of exercise has been associated with both the opioids and the endocannabinoids changing the way that the dopamine reward circuit works and it what's interesting about that is it changes it in the same way that we see it changed in um, drug addicts so or drug addicts or gambling addicts so that addictive change to the reward circuitry is the same change to the reward circuitry that we see in that repetitive uh, linear um, intense exercise now, I'm wow. not suggesting that it's exactly the same experience as drug taking, because clearly the two are different, exercise and different drugs and gambling, etc. So they will have different um, experiences associated with them. But at the neurobiological level, you've got the same changes to the reward circuitry happening. And so then it becomes easier to understand why the dog is motivated to do that behavior because its reward circuitry isn't working normally anymore. So it's not the case that the dog is now in control of saying, that's no good for me, I'm not gonna do it. The same way as a drug addict or a gambler knows that it's not good for them, but they can't stop it because the motivation yeah. to do that behavior is so high because of the abnormal reward circuitry that it completely overrides any thought process about this not being a sensible thing to do. So I think that we've got two things going on with that type of ball throwing. We've got the analgesia and the overriding of the pain signals by the brain, but we've also potentially got an addictive component and not all dogs will be addicted um, but some dogs definitely will and interestingly I was reading about um, addiction uh, addictive withdrawal from exercise intense exercise so this is in athletes that then have an injury and so can't carry on training and they go through a physical withdrawal that is similar to the drug withdrawal that drug addicts go through wow and all of the symptoms that they described with that physical withdrawal were the same symptoms that I saw with my own Belgian Shepherd dog when I started weaning her off ball throwing. And I had mm -hmm. I, I had already had an inkling that she was addicted um, uh, to the ball throwing. Um, so I didn't stop the ball throwing straight away because I think that's that's too much of a shock. Okay 
oral. But what I did was I started to implement the types of things that we're talking about. So at first I still used a ball, but I used it more slowly. And what I tended to do was roll it along the floor so it wasn't being flung in the air. Um, and also um, roll it in different directions, but do something in between each throw. So like throw the ball and then walk on a bit, do a bit of scent work or sniff in a bush or whatever, or sit down and have a cuddle. Yeah, and then throw the ball again. So she's still getting that that um, that hit, if you like, of the ball throwing, but it's broken up. So she's not getting that same repetitive um, exercise that's associated with the change in the reward circuitry. Um, and right, then one. Of course, are, are people allowed? So, so we've got a number of behaviourists, we've got therapists, we've got nurses watching this, and they're dealing with their clients in a consult who hasn't been part of CAM. So they're all new to this. And they have a Labrador that is completely obsessed with the ball. It comes in with the ball in its mouth, never lets go of it, and just brings it and drops it, brings it, drops it, feet, brings it, drops it, feet, brings it, drops it, feet, like my sister used to do. And, but the dog also has severe arthritis in its hips. It's got some spondylosis of its back. It's got a lot of soft tissue compensatory change. And that nurse is trying to have a conversation and persuade that owner that actually the dog isn't necessarily having a great time. The dog is actually addicted. Can she or he, can they say it's very similar to you having a son that sadly has got into a, a bad group and he's become really quite fixated and he's hanging off your handbag going, give me some money, just give me some money because I need to go and get, I need, I need to go and get. Are they allowed to say that or is that too much? Because it's, it's the same neurobiological process that you get a change in the motivation, motivational drive and what we call hedonic drive. So what you perceive as being enjoyable and that's altered in fast, intense, repetitive exercise in the same way as it's altered in drug addicts and gamblers. So you can definitely say that it's similar to, you know, a, a teenage son or daughter who has unfortunately got addicted to drugs who will literally climb out of a second floor window to go and score. They're highly motivated to go and do that. And they will tell you that's what they want to do in that mm -hmm. moment. But of course, we all know that, you know, when they're sitting and reflecting on what, what negative effects that's having on them, they're able to see that that's not what they want to do. But as soon as the motivational drive comes again, then their behavior reflects a huge drive and huge motivation to do that, that um, to seek that reward. Um, and so it, we don't we don't know, obviously. Um, well, we know that the experience of it isn't the same because we can talk to athletes who become addicted to exercise. A exercise addiction isn't new. We've known about this, um, you know, for, for decades and have studied it for decades. Um, but it's like a, a, a sort of um, I guess like a milder effect. It's still it's still um, a change in the reward circuitry. So it's still abnormal reward circuitry that change your motivation. Um, and it needs to be dealt with in exactly the same way. So just the way that athletes can't just suddenly stop exercising without getting side effects, we can't suddenly stop our dogs from um, experiencing that intense exercise we need to wean them off it like a drug addict so eventually I weaned Raven onto frisbees and the advantage that frisbees have is that they stay in the air for longer so they automatically slow down the movement because they're hovering more I mean I had to practice the frisbee for a while because I was pretty rubbish at throwing it to start with yeah. she was like what yeah. was that <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can either roll it along the ground or you can hover it in the air. It's also um, the other advantage to it is it's not just slowing down. So it's not just reducing the trauma to the joints, but it's actually engaging the thinking part of the brain. So if we come back to that cognitive override, what it's doing now is actually engaging the thinking part of the brain in where's that Frisbee going? Because the Frisbees don't go in a straight line. So they're having to think and change their positioning, etc., associated with trying to catch the frisbee. And that's very different to ball throwing. And that gets them back into a brain state where they're starting to integrate their sensory information in a more balanced way. So they're not totally and utterly.
utterly tunnel vision on that that ball as a target to the exclusion of all other sensory information. Once you're encouraging them to start activating the prefrontal cortex and think about what's going on with the frisbee, then you're automatically getting the brain into a state where it can balance that sensory integration into a more healthy. You can break brain. that horrible reward circuit. Yeah. And making holes in it and breaking that feedback loop. Feedback. Yeah. Loop. Exactly. And now, I mean, it's taken me three or four months. I've had her for quite a while. But for the first time the other day, she was able to go out, catch a frisbee and then do something completely different for five minutes. And believe you me, she couldn't do that at first. She would mug me, she'd have the jaw judders like, <laughs> like this to try and get the frisbee. She would just totally be focused on the frisbee. Um, so yeah, we're, I'm starting to see now that we're, we're interrupting that reward circuitry and we're starting to see a more normal balanced physiology associated with that game. Um, I may well phase out the Frisbee completely. I'm not sure if I, if I think I can do that while still getting some of the benefits of the exercise and do that slowly so she doesn't have withdrawal symptoms or such marked withdrawal symptoms as I saw initially when I just stopped the ball throwing, then I will. Um, but uh, yeah, for now, I'm quite pleased that we've got the frequency of throws down. So now if I go on a walk, I might throw it four or five times. Whereas before a walk would be, I don't know how many, like 20 oh, or 30. These, um, these dogs that just, as you say, that it's just non-stop and they will not give up. And I think for me, take it into um, bringing it home to me, how quickly Luna has become obsessed with people throwing stuff for her. So. I um I made every mistake with Holly and I'm fully happy to put my hands up and say I have had a steep learning curve. And I looked back and I reflected on a lot of things that I felt really contributed to to how she was when she was older. And I decided, no, I'm not gonna do that with Luna. I'm definitely going to be in much more in control and I do not want her to obsess about items, be it stones in the sea, be it sticks, be it balls, be it anything. So um there's me bringing up my lovely little fur child and during lockdown I started walking with somebody that was quite happy to keep throwing sticks and that's what they did for their dog and it was almost their uncontrolled behavior subconsciously they weren't even aware they were doing it and before I knew it Luna fixed it absolutely fixated and she's become a pain in the ass and I'm yeah. now everybody please don't do that it's very difficult though isn't it it is because you get that change to the reward circuitry. So that's what they're driven to do. Um, it's It just becomes so highly, highly rewarding that they can, yeah, exclude any negative effect. I was going to say that, like in an episode. So if I can catch Luna and grab her out of it quite quick. So if somebody's thrown something and I was standing next to that person, if I go, whoa, 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 no, come on, come back. Come back to me. Um, she, can, she kind of like snaps out of it, okay. But if I haven't been looking and that person has been throwing it for, you know, five, ten minutes, it's much harder to break the, the fixation. Yeah. Well, that's because her, her her attention is now entirely focused. So she starts off, oh, there's a ball. There's also mum. There's also other people in the park or whatever. But it's it becomes focused on just there's a ball, there's a ball, there's a ball. And so all other sensory information, including you... <laughs> It's completely ignored. So it may well be, particularly for those dogs that are highly fixated, that they're not ignoring you. They literally cannot hear you because they're not processing auditory, auditory stimula stimulation. So, you know, you say, oh, the dog's gone deaf. You know, it goes deaf whenever I call it. It may actually be, I mean, you know, it depends on the situation, but if you've got a dog that is highly fixated on the ball, it is extremely likely that they are genuinely deaf. They literally cannot hear you because they've shut down the activity in their temporal cortex that would usually receive the incoming sound. So yeah, that is, that's a real that brain knocker. Right? Just for you that, that, that are listening, they don't go, I'm gonna just switch off my hearing yeah. now. <laughs> It kind of is a little fuse which goes it's out of their control. So let's just kind of recap and go back over why this was a necessary Facebook Live. So for people that have joined in and they've gone, oh my God, too much jargon. This is quite intimidating. What is a very simplified take home message for owners of arthritic dogs, be them young, 
with early elbow dysplasia and actually they're okay a lot of the time, but they know that there's a problem that's brewing all the way through to a dog that's really quite debilitated most of the time, but they see, keep seeming to have bundles of energy when they're all about. What is your message? Why are you here? So what you really want to do is you want to harness all the benefits of exercise. So all the pain killing parts of exercise, the mood enhancing parts of exercise without altering that reward circuitry. So you want to avoid those repetitive, high impact, high intensity exercises and actually replace them with activities that have been proven to have the same benefits as exercise without some of the side effects. So that's where things like um, scent work come in. So engaging olfaction or scent. Um, so whether that's snuffling around the park, like snuffling in the grass or scattering little bits of food or grated cheese um, across an area in the park so that they can snuffle around, um, walking around and snuffling in the bushes, etc., or actually doing formalized scent work. So training them to find stuff so that you can hide a toy in the park and their game is to to find it etc and scent work has been shown to um, improve mood reduce anxiety and provide some analgesic or pain relieving properties but you don't get that same alteration to reward circuitry so that the animal becomes obsessed with it usually mm -hmm. there will be the odd animal that becomes obsessed with scent work um, but as a general rule um, that's a really good activity and then other activities are things like what we would commonly call enrichment activities. So things like snuffle mats. Um, and it, uh, have you seen the, uh, I've got some now for a raven, some snuffle mats that I bought that are like a big bowl with a tie in the top. And they've got like fingers of material in the bottom and you can scatter grated cheese or grated sausage or whatever. Oh. It. Yeah, it's brilliant. So what you do is you pull the drawstring and then I take that to the park with me so I can carry it to the park without the food spilling everywhere. And then when we get to the park, I can open it up and then she can snuffle about in it. And I use that initially to bring her down from the high of the ball chasing. So I was basically teaching her that actually the park isn't for ball chasing. We'll do a bit of ball chasing because we're weaning you off that. We're basically, you know, withdrawing you slowly. But what I really want you to focus on is being able to then calm down after the, that type of exercise. Yeah. So I take the snuffle mat to the park and get her nose engaged in snuffling around in that so that it would bring down her levels of adrenaline, bring down her heart rate, improve her mood and just kind of level everything out and importantly balance her sensory integration so that she's then coming back down um, to a physiological condition where she can hear everything that's going on see everything that's going on feel everything that's going on and think about it um, rather than just be in that kind of wired state like wired. this yeah um, Lynn, tell rosemary about these we want them in the shop <laughs> 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 they're brilliant yeah they're really good and I use them now I mean she's got a few issues um but she also gets very very hyped like this and that's partly a, a similar um alteration to the reward circuitry associated with um going in the car or the van so I use that same technique when she comes out of the van she I mean she just looks like she's been injected intravenously with Red Bull um mm -hmm. so I'll put a snuffle mat on the ground and I'll get her nose engaged and wait until that heart rate's come down wait until I can see that she's processing all of the different sensory information so wait until I can see that she's looking around her and responding proportionally and appropriately to what's going on and sometimes that takes a few seconds or a, a minute or so and sometimes it takes 15 20 minutes it just depends on a variety of other factors and I think that's the same for kind of bringing them back down after intense exercise um so yeah just, just to butt in with the exercise thing I think um, it's really fair to add in the musculoskeletal health component of exercise the worst thing you can do for an arthritic dog is not exercise them because these joints need to be going for a full range of motion to the best of their ability to maintain the health within the joint as well as the soft tissue structures that support that joint and prevent the unwanted movements that often progress the disease and cause discomfort. So exercise is so, so important for their musculoskeletal health. You know, the tissues, our bodies are designed to flow and blend and move over each other. We're not supposed to be static. So the whole point of this Facebook Live was to try and bring 
a really complicated neuroscience into exercise is important, guys, really, but the right exercise. And you know, the, the difference is if, if you watch the dogs running around of their own accord, so what I would call unforced exercise. So whenever you're using a Frisbee or a ball, that's forced exercise. In other words, you denote when the ball's thrown, how far it's thrown, how fast it's thrown. And the dog essentially has no choice. It's motivated to chase it regardless. So that's forced exercise. But if you look at the dogs when they're running around unforced exercise, so trotting around, sniffing, maybe having a little canter, etc. They're still, they're, they're, their brains are still integrating all of the information. So they're still able to perceive pain. And that doesn't mean that they're not getting the analgesic component associated with exercise. They are, but because it's less intense, if they do something that is really painful, they will feel it and they will stop doing it. So you'll see the dogs modify the way that their feet fall and the type of exercise they do, maybe how, how far they run for or how fast they run, etc because their brains are still able to process that incoming information. As soon as you go to forced exercise, you override that sensory integration. And so then the animal loses out on all of that information and it doesn't have it anymore. So it's not going to make decisions about how far and how fast and how long to run because it doesn't have all of the information available to it. No, I, um, I'm just going to say something I'm a little bit proud of, which everybody probably thinks that I'm crazy. So my whole family think that Luna's on the spectrum. She, I think she probably is. But she um, she goes off and entertains herself. I know it sounds dark, yeah. but it was, um, I have really not wanted her to be fixated on anything. She takes herself off like she's in Swallows and Amazons and goes and sniffs the bush. <laughs> She's in Luna. We call it Luna's world. She goes off in Luna's world. I actually yeah. know she's really content. That's you know, she, so important. Oh, yeah. God. Oh, my God. It makes me happy, but I'm sure my whole family think that my dog is highly on the spectrum and is just <laughs> varies, but she's not. She's actually very <laughs> I mean, it's one of the things I use to monitor Raven, my um, excessively obsessive ball dog, um, is if I see we go to the park and I've got a frisbee in my hand, but she chooses to sniff around, then I know we're getting somewhere because she absolutely could not do that before. But that's clearly high level cognitive information. Mum's got the frisbee, but actually it's OK for me to go and sniff over here. So already we're working um, the way I think about it, which is perhaps different to most owners. But the way I think about it is, OK, I've now got her brain in a state where I am prepared to do a little bit of frisbee throwing. If I don't see that, if we get to the park and she's obsessively staring at the frisbee and usually what happens is it escalates to her jumping up and maybe grabbing me and stuff like that, then the frisbee goes away because her brain state is not in a state where I want to exercise her because she's not going to be able to modulate her locomotion according to whether it's painful or not she's not going to be able to stop herself when she's had too much for instance and she's not going to be able to know what her limits are she's going to push herself beyond her limits and just for anyone who doesn't know the background to Raven she was a she's an ex-police dog general purpose police dog so she's used to working through any amount of pain or distraction and just being totally focused and that really benefited her that that ability that her brain has to go into that trance-like state that's fixated on one goal and one goal only was a huge benefit when she was a police dog but of course now she's in a pet home that isn't such a benefit because that is the type of brain state that's going to lead to early arthritic change um and damage because she's just going to keep throw the ball throw the ball throw the ball throw the ball <laughs> and yeah. she would she wouldn't be able to entertain herself like Luna can. So part of my job is to teach her to get reward and get an equal value reward from entertaining herself. And actually, observational learning worked great. Nancy, my Rottweiler, has taught her to scavenge. So now she goes around the streets and she's not looking at my Frisbee. She's looking for bits of kebab and pizza and stuff. And I'm like, hey, I'm not coming to live with you, Kathy. <laughs> Why do you watch these things to work out what you should be doing? And you don't watch all the good things. <laughs> <laughs> it's very very true well we're at the hour point we've got some questions do you want to to kind of do a couple because the thing with your area is there's not going to be a quick answer to anything so what we can do is scroll back through and just try and tackle a few or do you want to come back and we'll do another where we tackle some of these questions at a later date 
Oh, I don't mind, whatever. I mean, people probably would rather see if I can answer some of them now, but I don't mind. Yeah, let's, just, um, let's just do uh, the first the answers, but let's see. Okay, so there we go. One, I've just scrolled up just the first one. Christine Robertson, my dog gets a high from chasing squirrels. She never catches any. She has hip dysplasia and arthritis. What are your views? I let her do what she wants and go where she wants when she is doing this. If she knows no pain, maybe I should be stopping her. Yeah, so I would consider squirrel chasing forced exercise in the same way as ball chasing is forced exercise in that she has a trigger and she most likely has altered reward circuitry associated with that trigger. And so she will override any pain signals, etc., in order to chase a squirrel. So I would view it very much in the way that we've been discussing ball chasing and, and frisbee chasing. So that doesn't mean it's all or nothing. It doesn't mean like from now on, you never chase another squirrel. And actually that's probably impossible unless you keep her on the lead the whole time. But it does mean that you start now weaning her off it and reducing her opportunities to do that. Whilst also importantly, adding in opportunities to do something else so if she's good at chasing squirrels you just look for something else that she's going to be motivated to do so whether that is scent detection work or whether that is um rolling a ball along the floor would be better than chasing squirrels um because you can roll it slowly um there's actually a really good game called sheep balls um from kay lawrence have you seen that hannah no um, so, uh, yeah, if you Google on YouTube Sheep Balls by Kay Lawrence, it's a way of uh, using balls really slowly, um, particularly with herding breeds. I don't know what breed your, your dog is, um, to get them to interact with the ball in a way that doesn't stress their joints, etc., but does fulfill their need to, um, to herd. Now, it may not, depending on what the driver is for your dog, it may not be suitable because your dog may be sight motivated. And so it's actually motivated by the 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 sight of the chase um so then you'll need to find something else that's more similar like rolling a ball along the floor um, is this lady so she's going she, say she's going to the park and there's a tree line down the side of the park and she always knows that there's going to be squirrels there is she wise to avoid and take a different path is she wise to take something distractive knowing that as soon as she hits that bin which is four foot from that tree her dog starts going i know squirrels would she be wise to take a distraction and try and dis distract See, the dog? If, from if a distractor works, then that's fantastic. In most cases, with an obsessive type behavior, it, it's too late for a distractor, in most cases, because the distractor isn't as rewarding as chasing squirrels. So it depends on how intense that, that drive is for chasing squirrels. But what I would do if the drive is really intense is walk along that line of trees with the with the dog on the lead so that you're scaring all the squirrels up into the trees and then at the other end let the dog off and walk back through the trees because if you're going for the first pass the squirrels are already going to be out if the squirrels have heard you coming and they know you're tramping through that that row of trees they're already going to be up and so there won't actually be any to chase or they're much less likely to be any to chase or avoid areas where they're high squirrel chasing areas and you're never going to be able to avoid it completely but um yeah or try or the other thing to, do is to look for like small areas where you've only got a small area of trees clear it i.e make loads of noise so the squirrels all go up and then let the dog off so the dog still has the reward of the anticipation and of snuffling around and of searching for the squirrels but it's very unlikely to have that intense forced exercise associated with chasing a squirrel which is the bit that will do the damage to the joints and i think um, i think it's fair to say something that i learned right at the beginning when i was going into people's homes and i was trying to get them perfection is that's not possible so um we have some um, owners that really beat themselves up if they've tried to implement a restriction or a, a change in routine or and then the dog is off the lead at the wrong moment it chases the squirrels and they feel like they've really let themselves down everything in life you know reduce the quantity is still going to give benefits so don't beat yourselves up guys okay, no, no. we're going up so any questions that are below that i'm sorry we'll come back to you next time what do you think of the idea that dogs who have certain emotional states like anxiety are more prone to this kind of addiction, possibly as a coping mechanism, such as in humans? Ooh. 
Yeah, so there is research to show that high anxiety might predispose you to addiction. So might predispose you to that change in the reward circuitry. That's certainly true. It hasn't been studied in dogs. And the difficulty with dogs is that we still don't yet have um, validated, good, solid, validated ways of being able to tease apart some of the behavioural signs that we see. So um, generalised anxiety disorder, for instance, might be diagnosed, but it's diagnosed based on symptomology. It's not diagnosed based on um, cognitive testing or um, emotional testing, etc. Usually, I mean, this is kind of simplistic. So we're still in the process of developing those tests. Um, and it's only by developing those tests that we'll be able to separate dogs into cohorts so that we can really study this in dogs. But certainly in humans and certainly in other species, there is a link between those two. OK, and we'll do the last one. This is um, Joe Rosie Haffenden. Do you find a difference in your frequency of throws when you go for a walk when you used Frisbee in training? When I got Blake, he was also had total collie ball brain. Now we only use toys in training and not on the walk. He puts any attention off that sort of chasing, etc. Uh, behaving walk now and just chill. If though, he does, sorry, I'm getting really confused with this. If though he doesn't get any training, the fixation type behaviors tend to increase. Oh, I think she's. I think she's trying to say that um, if she doesn't do um, the training and using the toys in the training, then the fixated behaviors get worse on her walking. So she's tried to separate the two and does that make sense yeah it does make sense and obviously if you're starting with I'm presuming I don't think Blake's got any arthritis um but I'm presuming that you're starting with a dog that uh doesn't have chronic inflammatory pain or chronic pain and inflammation within the joints so that certainly makes sense to be able to channel that I mean some dogs like collies like mallies etc they have a brain that will very very quickly fixate on repetitive um repetitive tasks like ball throwing like frisbee throwing etc so they're kind of predisposed to that but that doesn't mean that they enjoy it more it just means that their brain defaults to that circuitry more readily so it's almost like um yeah it's, it's almost like a curse um rather than a um you know a benefit it's not that they're getting more enjoyment out of it it's just that they're more likely to then change their reward circuitry associated with it and more likely then to become fixated and obsessed with it and if you've got a dog that doesn't have arthritis already it's really good to be able to channel that because not only are you then controlling the intensity and the duration of it, but you're also actually controlling the time that it's exhibited. So you can choose your training time. And as the dog gets older, you can then change the frequency of training times and also change the, the intensity of the training times. If you've got a dog with arthritis already, that's where um, I was talking about weaning them off. And I... It depends entirely on the case. There will be some cases where it just doesn't work to stop them having access to that type of exercise. That they, you know, they've been practicing that behavior for so long and their brain circuitry is wired to reward from that behavior um, that you may not be able to stop it completely. And that's where what you're saying, Hannah, is absolutely bang on. It's not about all or nothing, it's not binary. It's about mm -hmm. modifying it so that it's lower impact and making sure that it's less intense and making sure that the duration is shorter. So you're just making little changes to different aspects of it to make the impact lower um, on the dog's joint. Yeah, and I think that's really fair. Like a lot of people say to us, he's always, always been obsessed with the ball. Well, it doesn't mean you need to get rid of them. He can carry it and you can still just roll the ball. You can hide it in long grass and they can still have that 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 interaction with the ball, which is what they're fixating on. Um, I think I think some of us are really black and white, which go right, we'll stop it. I'm gonna throw all the tennis balls away now, tomorrow. Ball chuck is yes. You have every reason to throw that. <laughs> yeah. I don't it. see any benefit to ball chuckers, but yeah. No, in them. Stand outside the pets at home and go, no. <laughs> yeah. When you see the little pink ones for puppies, blows my brain, just blows my brain. Yeah, before their growth plates have even fused. Oh. No, no. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's everything in moderation. And you know, when I see the backlash about ball throwing on Facebook, it's always, that's ridiculous. They've got to enjoy themselves. You're the fun police, blah, blah, blah. But it's, it's too polarized. Like we all know that social media is incredibly polarized. That's what's so fun apparently and so rewarding about engaging in social media is the polarization. But the, the honest truth is you just have to apply a little bit of common sense. It's not about, you know, doing ball throwing or not doing ball throwing. It's just looking at the ball throwing and then looking at, you know, what effect you think it's having on the dog. You know, is the dog getting a really short duration, intense exercise that leaves it exhausted and it's then stiff the next day? Well, then probably modifying it would be a good thing just by changing the intensity, changing the speed of the ball, reducing the number of throws, doing something else in between each throw, you know, distracting them with a little bit I've of something. I've got a really good story for this, just for people to put it into context. So I was chatting to a vet who, he's been around the block, you know, he's probably been qualified for 30, 40 years. And when I was telling him my thoughts about ball throwing, because we were going to go and lecture to a load of nurses and he wanted the content of the lectures to be very practical. He didn't want it to be, you know, just the normal here. This is our way. This is what it is. This is what it does. He wanted us to, you know, their minds to be expanded. And I said, well, am I allowed to talk about ball throwing and stuff? And he he was really quiet on the phone. And I thought, uh oh, I've gone too far. <laughs> over the line and he's going to disinvite us to go and lecture to his nurses and then there was a pause and he sheepishly went I have to really wholeheartedly agree with you on that because of the mistakes that I made and he had gone on holiday so he had um, a chocolate Labrador that had been consistently laying bilateral ball limbs and um, he had on different medications etc and then he went on holiday and the dog had stayed with his elderly mother and when he came back after two weeks, the dog didn't have the outward clinical signs of lameness. So the dog was walking better. And nothing had changed except his mum was not able to bend down and pick up the ball. So the ball throwing had stopped for that two weeks. Right. And he, he went, obviously. <laughs> and that was from a guy that had, would have been, you know, he qualified as a vet in probably the 1980s. Um, for him to say that, I think, is a really solid, you know, come on, guys, look at what you're doing with your dog. We've got this big group of people that are anti-medication, they're anti-putting anything um, chemical or medication-based into their dog's bodies. Well, look at your dog's lifestyle because there's probably much you can do to improve their perpetuated pain state and the progression of the disease. Yeah. and also their behavior I mean, even with animals that don't have arthritis so even when you're talking about you know the younger dogs um it's just it yeah it's being able to engage in tasks and activities that allow them to have that balanced sensory integration and and avoid that incredible focus now there are some dog sports for instance where you need that incredible focus um, in order to be successful at the dog sport but then it's really important to be able to teach the dog how to come down from that and that is as mm -hmm. important um, for the dog it's definitely more important but it's as important than actually teaching them to be good at the dog sport in the first place or that particular task you know it's fine to be able to direct them to an intense activity and to be able to train them to be good at that but you've also if you're going to be responsible you've also then got to make sure that they're trained in how to bring themselves back down and what that mm -hmm. looks like and making sure that they can engage in other activities um, and that activity doesn't become obsessive to the exclusion of all other input. And you don't actually see that much when you look at like the agility sports and the flyable sports and these ones that are pushing them to a real focused high drive kind of state. Is that still under the same heading of decompressing them? Can they, would yeah. they decompress after an activity and that's where you allow them to do those low impact repetitive things like the snuffle mats like yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah. And actually there's a really good course bobby banbury from behavior vets does a good course on decompression for agility dogs um and oh, that's, wow. that's all about 
the benefits of actually using decompression to improve their performance. So that's becoming more and more popular, particularly in the States, as people are now starting to realize that not only is it a good idea from the perp from the point of view of brain health, but actually they're seeing improvements in performance in dogs that are um, taught how to Can decompress. Can you tell me the link? We'll put it on here for people that are interested. Okay, yeah. Good. On that part, I'm going to start bringing this to a close, partly because um, what I want to big up going to Barking Brain. So now that you've listened to Kathy or the couple of hundred that have come and gone today, there will be a link and I want you to go over and I want you to press follow because you're going to be hearing a lot more from this lady. Um, Kathy puts quite, you know, really solid thought through post up a couple of times a week. Um, not like us, I just... Well, that frequently. <laughs> I now put the pressure on. Oh my God, Bobby's actually watching you. She just oh, said, hey, shout out. Yeah, you did, Bobby. Put your blooming link down so people can come and find you. Um, so Bobby then, and Joe Rosie, those are two people who've really supported me with my own dog, who definitely had obsessive addiction to the ball. Um, so yeah, thank you to both of those. No, I think, that, I think it's, I wouldn't have known that these recent resources existed so please please put links so that people can go and find answers and solutions next thing is to shout out that you've got a seminar coming up soon on sensory yeah. integration, on sensory integration. and it's not yeah, specifically so on pain but it's on the same uh it's on the same subject in terms of um how sensory integration can go wrong um and we're looking at a behavior case so it's the same principles that we've been talking about today even though it's not specific to arthritic dogs it's the same neurobiology so if you if you were interested in that neurobiology you'd be very interested in the seminar okay cool and then finally because i've still got loads of questions coming in what we're we're going to do is get Kathy back and um, so don't think that your questions won't be answered what we will do is we will put a really big advert out so you know that she's coming back and we will tackle these questions in a Q&A type approach maybe in a few weeks couple of weeks give it sounds good yeah whenever whenever Amazing. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'd like you all to say your thanks because mm -hmm. Kathy is such a dear friend of mine. I'm so grateful that she came on and gave us all of her amazing intelligence, knowledge, wisdom. Um, and head over to her Facebook page. You really won't regret it. And then I will be seeing you guys next week. I think I am. Oh, I'm not sure. I know I'm doing Mike Farrell soon. That's going to be a really good one. That's going to be about young dog. I'm with Mike Farrell. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we need to talk about young dog arthritis. Yeah. What? You didn't what? I haven't, I haven't seen them since vet school. That's like 20 years ago. <laughs> right. Well, I think it's the 15th of October. I can't think of who's next. But we've also just secured David Somerville to come and do a five-day, every evening chat about electrotherapies. So anybody that is using them in their work or have their electrotherapies done to dogs, so we've got laser, we're going to have pulse electromagnetic field therapy, we're going to talk about ultrasound, five days in a row. So that's coming up as well. Till then, thank you very much, guys. We will speak Thanks soon. Don't everyone. Buy a hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, guys. Bye, everyone.